Uh, yeah, I'm Bogdan Ugrian, and thank you for, for joining here. What we what I'll talk to, what I'll talk about today it will be our journey and our first experience with Quit for Mobile. Uh, to to have a further introduction for myself and for Fortec, I have almost ten years of experience in C C As you can see, mostly desktop application, CAD, CAM simulation, and the past two, three years, I also had some work on the IoT field. And yeah, it's really an, an, an interesting part. And also, since joining Fortex six years ago, pretty much all the projects I've been involved to covered Qt. And to, to, make, to have an idea about Fortec, about the company, we, we are a, a, an outsourcing company from Romania, Cluj Napoca. We provide end-to-end -end IT services and quite a large company, more than 600 people, covering all, uh, all major technology, pla pla also niche ones. Yeah, uh, as you can see, there is, in my experience, there's nothing for mobile. As I mentioned, the company had resources to, to build mobile application in, with native te technologies, Android, iOS. So how do we end up building a Qt for mob, uh, an app using Qt? Yeah, that's what uh, we'll talk about today. First, I'm, I'm going to, to give an overview about the context, how we, we took this de decision. Then we'll have an overview over the, over the solution we took, what were the points taken, taken in consideration, what, what we consider, what we had to, to focus on. Then we'll, we'll cover two, two big areas. One, where Qt helped us in our work, things which were way more easier than expected when using Qt. Plus, the bad parts where Qt got in our way, we had to do some ugly workarounds, we had some trouble days with thinking that things will crash all, all the way, could not go to the end. And, and then we we'll talk about the, the integration with OS features. As any multi-platform thing, we expected that there, there were parts where we could not write only in Qt, and we knew we had to, to resort to G GNI calls on Android and to Objective-C code on, on iOS. And yeah, we'll show, show an overview on how we, how we did that, how we covered that. Yeah, so going further about the, the context, we, we started with this app. It was, I think we, we were contacted about two years ago by a bike manufacturer. They wanted to launch a new e-bike model and to, to work to com complement it to, the, to this bike, they also wanted a, an app. What the main features for, the, for this bike were, first, the communication between the, the, device, the bike, the hardware, and the mobile app would be done through Bluetooth Low Energy. They had the protocol defined. They didn't have the hardware at that point. That came in a few months, year, something later. And as the main features, they wanted an intelligent control system for better usage. It's, I don't know if any of you use an e-bike. Did anyone use? Okay. <laughs> so the idea is that you have a limited range. Depending on the battery capacity, it can go something from 30Ks to 100 if you really struggle with it. But the thing is, if you 
if you pedal and you end up with, uh, with an empty battery five kilometers from home and you still have to go uphill, that's kind of unpleasant. And we, we had to, to consider several scenarios where we, we would help, we would control how the, how the bike uh, helps pedal, helps the cyclist. Also uh, adapting to the, to the cyclist style, learning his ways and yeah, basically working, personalizing the, the mode in which the bike rides with, the, with how the cyclist works. Then, this was the, probably the main use case. We had to consider the second one. Some people just don't want an algorithm to control their, their ride. So they want to fine tune the, themselves and we have to, to give them those possibilities as well. Then like any app, we need to, to connect to sports web services, social media, because yeah, we ride, we go to places, and if we don't brag about it, it didn't happen. It's just, we have to do it. And in the end, also the, the usage statistics. People apparently are really interested in seeing graphs, tables, how much, how many steps they did, how many uh, uh, ped pedaling cycles, they did how many kilometers, they, they really need to know, to know everything. So the, this, this was, these were the requests we, we received from, the, from that company. So how we ended up from this, knowing that I and my team had no experience in mobile app development, and the company had mobile app development experts, how we ended up with Qt for mobile. So what, based on the requirements, we realized we had to do the following. We had a uh, request for an Android and an, OS and an iOS app. We had to implement complex business logic. This means the control algorithms, the statistics, and if you go with two different apps, you have double the code base, double the chances of introducing bugs. And it might happen that they get developed at different rates and then you just get stuck with an old app because the, the other one is not ready yet. Then the, another issue we had to, to solve was to have the same user experience for bo both platforms. What, what has also been uh, talked in the keynotes this morning, it's very important that the user has the same feeling when, when he uses a system. This, the whole e-bike stuff ends up to be an environment, a, comp a complete environment. And then either we use an Android phone or, or the iOS, we need to give the same user experience for the users. They, they need to feel that it's the same app. I mean, I, I guess everybody used an app on maybe on desktop or on or on a mobile phone, then switched to another one and couldn't recognize the app. It, it was like something different. It takes three days to get used to it. We didn't want that to happen. And yeah, what and based on this, the la the last two points were the key were the key decision factors. We realized that the risks are pretty big to, to have unstable apps diff to, to diverge with functionality. And because we had the, uh, available uh, an experienced team with Qt, they, on, on average, I think it's something like two or three years of working with Qt. And at that point, Qt 5.6 was the, the latest version, so it was some time ago. It had support for Android and iOS. We were really curious how these things go, how, how this thing goes. We, as I said, we never tried that. Okay, let's, let's try it. We want to experiment, we want to learn new things. Plus, we also had the time. We, we knew the, the timeline for the, for the bike manufacturing, so we know it's, we had time. So in case something went bad, we could revert to, to better solutions. Okay, so 
Considering this, we ended up with a team which never wrote a mobile app in their life, writing a mobile app. <laughs> so now let's talk where, which was the, the solution we took. Ju just an overview, just uh, how, how we started. First, we, we had to, to clarify what, which were our input, which was our, our input. We, we discovered three main points, Bluetooth low energy from the bike. We have all the data from there. Then we had the external web services for sports trackers, for uh, social media, and, and user logging, stuff like that. And we also had the operating system specifics. Uh, sometimes we need to integrate with uh, specific uh, apps from the phone if they are present or similar similar stuff. How we how we did this? We initially we started just for the operating system specific stuff to create an interface and then add the specific implementation. Later we extended this to a, a lot more areas. Simply that simply because we realized it helps us test a lot. Mainly the algorithms I was mentioning, they weren't that good, the first draft. So we tried several options and it, it was much easier to have an interface than, than just replace the implementation. And it was just simply trial and error to find the, the best options. And then to, to all this structure also helped us to have the same GUI based on QML. And at this point, the QML files are exactly the same for both platforms. Yeah, now let's see where Qt helped us. Where uh, probably the, the biggest support we have, and really I wasn't expecting it to be this good, was the cute Bluetooth part. So the Bluetooth low energy connectivity classes, they were really easy to use. They had surprisingly good documentation, very good examples. Everything worked without, without issue from the first time. As developers, you know that that doesn't really happen very often. But yeah, it actually did. And what really we consider the best things there, they have really well-defined interfaces. You, I mean, if you are looking for something, it's straightforward to find it. You don't have to search through, I don't know, three classes, go around the, the bush, and yeah, hey, here it is. Now it's, it's the, where you expect it to. Then the behavior is as you expect it. Have the interface, you have the the definition of the protocol, and yeah, it does that. It doesn't have unexpected surprises, parts undocumented or something like that. And probably the most important thing was also it has the, the server support. As I mentioned earlier, you, we didn't have the hardware when we started. That means it was impossible to test on hardware. We had to, to develop a simulator. And we managed to do that in, I think, a month to support the entire protocol of the bike, which had three services, and each service, I don't know, four or five characteristics, and in each of them there were, in total I think there were something like 150 properties or something like that. So we were able to do that in a month. Yeah, also there, are, there were some parts not that big, but still which we consider could be, could be better. Some parts were left out. One thing we, it was really important for us was the scan data header, which we didn't get the, the, that information. It would have helped us, but we could do a workaround just inter uh, getting the data after we connect to this. And then we have, uh, we have different state transitions on Android and iOS. I think this is mostly re related to the, 
to the platform, not really too cute, but who knows? Maybe someone knows. <laughs> The, the other part where it help is the high DPI support. And, uh, the main issue was that on mobile phones, especially on Android, you have a wide range of resolutions and, uh, and uh, pixel ratios. And what we did here to, to, to fix this issue, uh, Qt has support for high DPI. This means that we can specify dimensions not in pixel, not in pixels, but in device independent units to, to have the same look regardless of the, of the resolution and the pixel ratio. And this, how we did it, we imposed a requirement on the designer that everything gets designed at the highest resolution possible. This way we only had to do one set of assets which will get scaled automatically at runtime. We did this by creating our own QML type, DP image, which is just a wrapper over an image which scales, scales automatically on specific rules. So yeah, the really good thing, the design work is, was really, really fast. We do one set of, of assets and that's it. We then, because it's only one set of icons, we need to keep track of less, less issue, of less items. We don't have so many things in the, in the app, so reduce the size a bit. However, the cons for our app, they are not that important. Uh, if you imagine like it's an app for an e-bike, you put it on a screen and you put it on the handlebar and you don't do any transitions after that. So, it, but if you change a lot, you might encounter performance issues when you, because you do the scaling at runtime. And another issue, the scaling was not always pixel perfect. We, how we handle this, we talk with the designer to adapt uh, the assets in, in a way that they scale perfectly. We identified some issues where, where the issues are and we worked on those assets to, to have them fixed. Yeah, now where Qt got in our way and caused a bit of, of pain was the keyboard input. The, the main issue was that when you have a text field and you need to enter some text. Depending on the platform, we, you would either get the, the text covered by the keyboard. If it was in the bottom part of the screen, you sometimes would mess up the entire layout. It, it was just a, me a mess there. What we ended up doing for both, um, for both platforms was actually connect and understand when we are going to, to show the keyboard and raise the screen accordingly to make space for the keyboard so it doesn't overlap. Kind of an ugly hack, hack but it worked. Yeah, then how we integrated with the operating system features this was something we knew we, we had to do beforehand, so there was no surprise this, no, no nasty surprise. Probably that's why we put the keyboard stuff as a bad part, because we didn't expect it. So, for example, we had as a task to select a profile picture for, uh, from the gallery. As I mentioned, we did uh, the approach to define a common interface. And for the Android implementation, we just did the JNI calls to the Android SDK. And then we had the callbacks handled in C++ functions. For the iOS, we had to implement the handlers in Objective-C. And we learned that as well. So two things in, in, one, in one go. Yeah. Uh, this was pretty much the whole thing. Our, 
our entire experience. I would say that the key takeaways, uh, as everything, they, there's never a silver bullet. There are some things which go really good. In our case, it helps with the one code base. We, we can keep the app Android and iOS in sync. We can make sure that if there is a bug, we fix it in, in all apps altogether. Really good thing was the Bluetooth low energy support, worked out of the box, the high DPI support. But also, as I mentioned, there were some, some bad parts. In our case, just the keyboard handling. So it's overall, I think, starting from, from scratch, not knowing anything on this part, it's still a good, a good score. And to, to complete our, our experience, to, to have it done, we still need to do publishing, and we'll see how that goes in the next months. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. If you have questions, yeah. Um, just one question. You mentioned that you were missing a feature from your Bluetooth stack in Q. Yeah. Did you consider uh, contributing a fix for it? If so, uh, did you do it? If not, why not? So we didn't, we considered, but didn't do it yet. Any reason behind that? Time. Time and resource allocation, mostly. Yeah, no problem. Yep. Yeah. Which tools did you use for programming? Yes, Qt Creator. Yeah, Qt Creator with the Android. Uh, uh, with Andro Android uh, libraries and so on. No, no, no. Just the libraries. And for the iOS, same Qt Creator, but running on Mac. Sorry? Is this something you recommend for uh, yes. apps? Yes. It worked without problems. We didn't encounter any issues, so. Uh, yeah. How many people were working on that, and how long do you think to go in that form? So the, the team worked in parallel on several projects. Uh, I would say it took about one and a half years, but on average, one and one and a half developers. There were periods when we were two, three working in parallel, and periods when no one was doing anything. But on average, it was something like this. Okay. okay. So. Thank you.